Afternoon Review, Print Speaking to the Blind, celebrating 40 years of audio newspaper production. Welcome to this week's edition of the National Podcast, recorded at the Bishop Briggs Media Centre by our amazing volunteers. You can get in touch with us via Facebook, Twitter or Instagram using at Kuhn Review, that is at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W. You can also contact us directly by emailing information at cunereview.com. That is I-N-F-O-R-M-A-T-I-O-N at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W dot C-O-M. Or by calling 0141 772 That's 0141 772 This is from The National on Friday the 16th of February 2024. From the comments section. Carbon capture is the wrong solution to the climate crisis. This article is written by Craig Dalzell. Scotland is in the midst of a grand sell-off of our land, again. Folk in the sector are openly saying that instead of valuing land based on grouse and deer... Scottish uplands are now being valued based on its ability to be harvested for carbon capture credits. Andy Whiteman recently announced that the US-owned, London-based hedge fund Gresham House is now the third largest private landowner in Scotland, based on this market. But this isn't a column about land reform, but instead about the push for carbon capture and sequestration itself which is increasingly being relied upon by politicians to greenwash their pro-fossil fuel policies. I was introduced to a different way of looking at carbon emission reduction, thanks to the valuable science communicator Hank Green. He recently showcased work done by the US-based Environmental Defence Fund that makes it much easier to see the job in front of us in terms of fixing the climate emergency The problem we face with many political solutions is that they are still putting off the work we need to do till later and are basically relying on unproven magical technologies rather than doing what we know we can do now, now. Rather than waiting until we've invented a ladder like carbon capture to pick all the fruit from the proverbial tree at once, we should pick the low-hanging fruit first while someone is away trying to invent the ladder. This is what the concept of Marginal Abatement Chart, or MAC chart, is about. It essentially shows us what the next lowest hanging fruit is, and which is the one just a little way above that. The EDF chart takes a traditional MAC chart a stage further by laying out the various technologies in terms of at what cost they switch on, and show when we can't really go any further with that particular technique. The challenge is this. The world needs to get not to net zero, but to actual zero carbon emissions, and honestly to real negative emissions, so that we can start to repair all the damage we've done up to the point where we reach net zero. This means getting the world from about 4.6 gigatons of carbon emissions per year down to something like minus 1.0 GT CO2 per year. All that remains is to work out how much money we want to spend right now to remove one tonne of carbon from the emissions budget. If we decide to spend nothing, there's obviously very little we can do, though not nothing. Some things like energy efficiency of electrical goods is basically happening for economic as much as environmental reasons, so would be likely to happen even if there was no climate emergency. The next lowest hanging fruits start to switch on at about $50 per tonne of carbon. These are cheap, already available techs like rolling out rooftop solar and onshore wind, and these make a major bite into the carbon budget. Around 2 gigatons globally out of that 4.6 gigatons challenge, but they also hit their limit shortly after this. 
Once you've rolled out enough solar and wind, it's hard to do it again. The roofs are full and the cheap land covered. You can get a little more by spending more, but at that point you start competing solar farms against crops and the diminishing returns settle in. Electrifying vehicles starts to ramp up at this point, and they can go a little further in terms of abatement costs. You can still pick more EVs as policy from the little higher up the tree than you can more solar. But these roll over too, as there comes a point where you've replaced all of the cars with EVs. Higher up the tree still starts to come the more expensive, less proven techs. Rolling out zero carbon fuels like biokerosene or later still hydrogen shouldn't be seriously talked about until you're already decarbonised every home boiler that you can see. And then, only once we're almost at the top of the tree, having eliminated 90% of current carbon emissions, and we're willing to spend something like $200 to eliminate the next highest tonne of carbon from the budget, can we realistically think about things like carbon capture? Its real value will be in taking us from net zero to real negative emissions. Carbon capture cannot be an indulgence paid by industry and very rich elites to allow them to keep polluting while the rest of us boil in their exhaust fumes. In short, our governments need to let go of the magic wand of carbon capture will let us do nothing and fix it later. I'm not saying we won't need it, it's just that in order to fix the climate emergency, carbon capture is the last thing we should do. That article was written by Craig Dalzell. This is from The National on Friday the 16th of February 2024 from the News section. Glasgow. Busy road closed after suspicious items found. This article is written by Kirsty Fearick. A busy road in Glasgow has been closed after suspicious items have been found in a property. Officers say Broomhill Drive between Dumbarton Road and Broomhill Avenue has been shut. It comes after suspicious items were found during a pre-planned search. Several homes have been evacuated and a cordon has been put in place. Locals are being urged to avoid the area. Glasgow City Council has set up an emergency rest centre for evacuated residents. A spokesperson for Police Scotland said, As a precaution, Broomhill Drive between Dumbarton Road and Broomhill Avenue in Glasgow is closed after suspicious items were found within a property following a pre-planned search. Several homes have been evacuated and a cordon put in place. Please avoid the area at this time. The fire service also confirmed their attendance at the scene. A spokesperson for the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service said, We were called to assist emergency service partner at 12.27pm on Thursday the 15th of February at an incident on Broomhill Drive, Glasgow. Operations Control mobilised two fire appliances and specialist resources to the scene. A Glasgow City Council spokesperson added, We have set up an emergency rest centre at Partick Burr Hall for anyone evacuated from their home as a result of this incident. We will continue to liaise with police and the fire service and will respond to any developments appropriately. That article was written by Kirsty Fearick. This is from The National on Friday the 16th of February 2024 from the News section. Glasgow City Council passes budget backing council tax freeze. This article is written by Lucy Jackson. Glasgow's local authority has passed its budget for the next three years with councillors choosing to freeze council tax. At a budget meeting on Thursday, the proposals were approved after a deal between the SNP and Green Groups on Glasgow City Council. It comes 
after Scotland's Finance Secretary, Shona Robertson, warned local authorities they will not receive money to cover a council tax freeze if they opt to increase the levy. Unions have protested against planned budget cuts to services in Glasgow, saying they are already on their knees. During the Glasgow Council meeting, City Treasurer Ricky Bell, from the governing SNP group, said the council tax freeze was fully funded. Council leader Susan Aitken also backed the council tax freeze. She said, We don't have the powers in Scotland just now to address rampant inflation and mortgage rates. But we can choose not to pass an increase in this particular bill on to our residents during a tough time, even as we continue to argue for fundamental reform in local taxation. Drafting the budget had meant facing some tough decisions head-on, she said. Labour councillor Jill Brown said, We are accepting the council tax freeze as well. In a state where our citizens are suffering from a cost-of-living crisis, it is the only option available. However, she said the SNP Green Government at Holyrood had passed on drastic cuts to the local authority. The SNP budget for the council included cuts to teachers, she said. A report from officials said there was a £107.7 million spending gap over the next three years, following the latest settlement from Holyrood. Earlier this month, Robertson, who is also the Deputy First Minister, asked all of Scotland's 32 councils to confirm their intentions on the council tax freeze by February the 16th. However, the budget processes of many councils are expected to continue beyond this point. Local authorities across Scotland have been offered £144 million in compensation for the SNP's council tax freeze policy, though the umbrella body for local governments has said this is not enough. A Scottish Government spokesman said, The Deputy First Minister wrote to councils to ask for confirmation of their intentions on the council tax freeze by February 16th to inform Stage 2 of the Scottish Budget. Ministers recognise that by that date, councils may still be finalising their council tax intentions and those will be subject to confirmation at council budget meetings in February and March. That article was written by Lucy Jackson. This is from The National on Friday the 16th of February 2024 from the News section. How the critically endangered wildcat is being monitored in the Highlands. This exclusive article is written by Lucy Jackson. A conservation project based in the Highlands is working to save the European wildcat species from extinction. The Saving Wildlife project, primarily based in the RZSS Highland Wildlife Park, aims to recover the species through an in-house breeding programme. Wildcats are paired together in breeding locations in a secret location in the park, with the hope that any kittens born can eventually be released into the wild. The project is currently overseeing 16 wildcats in pre-release enclosures, 13 of which are kittens born last year. A team of experienced keepers and scientists look after the wildcats, encouraging them to exhibit natural behaviours such as hunting and pouncing. Yet human interaction remains minimal to protect the wildcats from seeking humans when they are released into the wilds. The team have a solution to this limited contact, an advanced monitoring centre which allows them to analyse behaviours and even to feed the wildcats remotely. The National was able to gain access to this monitoring centre to learn more about the project. Cameras, cameras and more cameras. The main room is reminiscent of a top-level security base. Every inch of the recovery project is covered by advanced cameras, which allow the team to monitor the wildcats from a distance. 
the team can access the footage from cameras in real time and can even move the angles of the camera by removing a joystick. There are more than 70 cameras placed in the breeding and pre-release enclosures which work both day and night to monitor the wildcat's activity. The cameras help the team to see whether the wildcats are exhibiting natural behaviours and to ensure that they are eating. The team also told us the first time they get to see any kittens that have been born is usually through the cameras. While we were there, the team were able to find a male adult wildcat sleeping, something they can do for up to 18 hours a day. The cameras also help the team to deliver life-saving health care without the need for physical interaction. The team can send footage from the cameras to the local vet, who is then able to make an assessment over any injuries or symptoms the wild cat is displaying. There are also remote feeders placed inside the enclosures, which the team can activate from a distance. The feeders mimic the sound of the food inside, replicating a natural hunting environment for the wild cats. The wild cats are also able to practice hunting by catching any mice or vole that find their way naturally into the enclosure. The future of wild cats. The European wild cat is the last wild feline living in Britain. The species is critically endangered, with around 150 estimated to be in captivity across the UK. The Saving Wild Cats project, expected to run until at least 2026, is led by the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland, RZSS, in collaboration with the Scottish National Heritage, Forestry and Land Scotland, Cairngorms National Park Authority, Norden's Art, Sweden, and Junda de Andalusia, Spain. The project hopes to release more wild cats into the wild this summer, with breeding season already underway. In a post on Twitter X, the project explained the process for the release of the wild cats. The post explores a timeline from when the breeding pairs are introduced to when kittens are eventually released. That article was written by Lucy Jackson. This is from The National on Friday the 16th of February 2024 from the news section. Scotch whisky exports reach £5.6 billion in 2023, figures show. This article is written by Adam Robertson. Scotch whisky exports topped £5.6 billion in 2023 in what's been described as a hugely successful year for the sector. Although the numbers are down from the previous record-breaking year, they are up on pre-pandemic levels. The Scotch Whisky Association, SWA, said the Asia-Pacific markets continue to dominate the growth in global demand, with the value of exports to China up by 165% on 2019. Scotch whisky exports were valued at £5.6 billion in 2023, with £1.35 billion bottles exported, the equivalent of 43 bottles per second. However, exports to the US, which remains the largest market by value, were down 9% on 2019 levels to £978 million. Reacting to the news, Scottish Trade Minister Richard Lockhead said the figures highlighted the importance of the sector to Scotland. After 2022's exceptional export figures, 2023 was another hugely successful year for the Scotch whisky sector and I congratulate everyone involved for their ongoing work delivering Scotland's leading single food and drink export, he said. In talks with the UK Government on trade agreement negotiations, we consistently set out the importance of improving opportunities for and removing barriers to Scotch whisky exports. Whisky is a Scottish success story with global impact. Scottish Government ministers regularly engage with the industry to understand how best we can help it to continue contributing to our economy supporting the tourism and hospitality sector and 
delivering high-quality jobs across the country. Meanwhile, the SWA is continuing to press for a longer-term removal of whisky trade tariffs in US-UK talks. SWA Chief Executive Mark Kent said, Scotch whisky has once again shown its export strength despite significant challenges across a volatile global trading environment. The figures demonstrate that Scotch whisky brands and distilleries are investing in their teams, their tourism offering, their long-term sustainability and their global presence to ensure that Scotch continues to be the world's favourite whisky. We know that the Scotch whisky industry is remarkably resilient as we look at these numbers against the backdrop of rising costs for consumers and businesses. But the figures are a reminder once again that the Scotch whisky success story cannot be taken for granted. We need to see more tangible support from government, both at home and in our priority markets, in order to continue to grow our export numbers and the resultant investment, employment and economic benefits that come with that. That article was written by Adam Robertson. This is from The National on Monday 19th of February 2024 from the News section. Out of control dog shot dead by Scottish police after horror attack by Ben Waddle. A dangerously out-of-control dog has been shot dead by police after a horror attack in East Kilbride. Officers say they were called to a report of a large bulldog-type dog attacking a collie dog on Mannering in the town on Sunday, February 18th at around 10.25am. 999 crews then raced to the scene where local police tried to restrain the animal. However, armed police attended the incident and the dog was shot dead. Following the shocking ordeal, three people were left with minor injuries. Now, officers have said an investigation is underway to establish the breed of the dog and there will also be a continued police presence in the area. The incident will also be referred to the Police Investigations and Review Commissioner as a firearm was discharged. A spokesperson for Police Scotland said, Around 10.25am on Sunday, February 18th, police were called to a report of a large bulldog-type dog attacking a collie dog on Mannering, East Kilbride. Local officers attended and attempted to restrain the dog, which was dangerously out of control. Armed officers subsequently attended and the dog was shot dead by police. Three people reported receiving minor injuries during this incident. Inquiries are ongoing to establish the breed of dog and there will also be a continued police presence in the area while inquiries continue. As with any firearm discharge, the circumstances of the incident will be referred to the Police Investigations and Review Commissioner. The news comes after an attack in Hamilton saw a similar dog shot dead after it hospitalised two men. That article was by Ben Waddle. This is from The National on Monday 19th February 2024. From the politics section. Expert debunks Home Office claim about Scottish asylum seeker figures. By Xander Elliards. Scotland is hosting more displaced people than England per capita, despite the Home Secretary's claims that it must do more, an expert has said. Dr Peter Walsh, a lecturer in migration at the University of Oxford's Migration Observatory, said that Scotland is home to 50% more displaced people than England per capita. It comes after James Cleverley, the Home Secretary, said in a letter to First Minister Hamza Yousaf 
that Scotland has taken proportionately half the number of asylum seekers given accommodation in England. The Tory minister asked that efforts were made to rapidly increase asylum accommodation north of the border, suggesting the use of a cruise ship off Edinburgh. Cleverly wrote that Scotland currently houses eight asylum seekers for every 10,000 people, less than the nine in Wales and half the 16 in England. He urged USAF to continue to work together to help address the challenges we collectively face. However, Walsh told BBC Scotland that while Cleverly's figures were correct, he was taking a narrow view that did not give the whole picture. The Oxford University expert said, It's helpful, I think, to take a broader view. The Home Secretary criticises the Scottish Government for not taking enough asylum seekers. Asylum seekers are those who reach the UK under their own steam, sometimes arriving without authorisation, such as by small boat, and then they claim asylum on British shores. So this excludes Afghans. It excludes Ukrainians. If we limit our analysis just to asylum seekers, it is true that Scotland hosts about half the number per capita than England does. However, we also know that Scotland hosts a lot of Ukrainians, 26,000 compared with 100,000 in England. But England has 10 times the population. So, per capita, Scotland hosts about 2.5 times more Ukrainians per capita than England. If we look overall at all the categories of displaced people that are hosted, that's Ukrainians, Afghans and asylum seekers, what we find is quite interesting. England hosts four people per thousand of its resident population and Scotland six. So, Per capita, overall, Scotland hosts 50% more than England. Marsh explained that many asylum seekers arrive on small boats over the Channel with the goal of living in London. The Tory government then disperses them around the UK and it is these arrivals that Cleverly is asking for Scotland to take more of. The expert said... There's a particular emphasis in the letter on what the Home Secretary refers to as large sites, so this would be akin to the Bibby Stockholm barge. We also have dedicated asylum accommodation facilities in England, typically disused military facilities. The challenge there is that these always encounter difficulties. In fact, our largest asylum accommodation site, Napier Barracks, an adapted military facility, was at some point closed down because a UK judge said it was unlawful to house people there because of the poor conditions. So these large sites are difficult to manage and some government estimates actually suggest they're more expensive than housing people in hotels. A Scottish government spokesperson said the Home Office is responsible for a provision of asylum accommodation, including hotels procured as a contingency initial asylum accommodation. Ministers have been clear that the UK government needs to respect the important role of local authorities in asylum dispersal and should provide more financial support for them as it presses ahead with plans to close asylum hotels. Scotland has consistently played its part in supporting asylum dispersal since it was introduced over two decades ago. We are committed to supporting people to integrate into our communities and to providing the safety and security they need as they begin to rebuild their lives. Scotland is offering sanctuary to more than double the displaced Ukrainians per head of population than any other part of the UK, with more than 39,000 people with a Scottish sponsor being granted a visa and more than 26,000 of those having arrived in the UK via a Scottish sponsor, with over 20,000 as a direct result of the Scottish Government acting as a super sponsor. 
as we did with the Syrian and Ukrainian resettlement programmes, which saw all 32 local authorities in Scotland participate and welcome displaced people into their communities, Scotland stands ready to offer refuge and sanctuary for those who are displaced. From the outset of the conflict in Gaza, the Scottish Government has called on the UK Government to use its existing UK resettlement scheme and ensure it is aligned with UNHCR to provide those who want to leave with the support they require. We have received the Home Secretary's letter and will respond in due course. That article was by Xander Erliards. This is from The National. On Monday, 19th February, 2024. From the Politics section. SMP attack aggressive Labour windfall tax proposals. By James Walker. Hamza Yousaf has said that the SNP will not let Scotland's North East go the way coal and mining towns went under Margaret Thatcher. Delivering a campaign speech in Aberdeen, the First Minister said this is what Labour are threatening to do and said the SNP will not back the proposals for extending the windfall tax to oil and gas companies. Keir Starmer promised a proper windfall tax earlier this month when he scaled back his party's £28 billion a year green investment pledge. A new energy profits levy for oil and gas production was introduced in 2022 after global energy prices shot up in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Labour intends to extend the tax to 2029 if they reach government, leading to panic in the sector. The body representing the offshore oil and gas industry recently announced it was holding what it calls emergency summits as a result. Yusuf has said there is extreme anger in the northeast of Scotland at Labour's aggressive plans. Joined by SNP Westminster leader Stephen Flynn, the MP for Aberdeen South, he said Aberdeen has bankrolled successive Westminster governments, Labour and Tory, but has received little in return. He said that is a source, rightly, of extreme anger. That anger reached new levels last week when Labour announced their plans to raid the North East energy industry to the cost of some 100,000 jobs to the sector, all while dumping their plans to invest in the green economy. He added, let's be abundantly clear, the SNP believes in a just transition. There is no justice in a transition that throws North East workers on the scrap heap. The SNP will not let the North East go the way that coal and mining towns went under Thatcher. That is exactly what Labour is threatening to do. You cannot deliver a just transition from oil and gas for the people and businesses that rely on it if you squeeze the life out of the sector overnight. That is why the SNP will oppose Labour's aggressive tax plans for the sector. The SNP leader took aim at Westminster parties, saying that when they need cash, they look to Scotland, and that when the Labour Party policy is designed solely to plug the massive financial hole in plans to build a new nuclear power plant in England. Once again, the workers of the North East are being asked to pay the price because of Westminster's economic and energy mismanagement, he said. The Tories are no better. They want to bury their heads in the sand. Having told Scotland for 50 years that oil is about to run out, they now want to pretend it can last forever, that we don't need change, that we can avoid making the investment needed in the new energy economy because the old one will always be there. Neither position is credible. He also pitched his party as the only one which can deliver Scotland's green future at His Majesty's Theatre in the city, 
saying that revenue gained through oil and gas taxation has been squandered by Westminster. Some would argue that this is a historic issue, a mistake of the past, but it has relevance today because we are on the verge of a similar opportunity. Scotland can be at the forefront of the green energy revolution. Using the skills and expertise developed in the North Sea in the 20th century to power the sustainable energy future of the 21st century. Making a major contribution to the international fight against climate change and creating huge economic opportunity here at home. The First Minister said that independence was the answer, adding, we need to grasp this opportunity ourselves, the opportunity of the green energy revolution and the opportunity of taking decisions in Scotland for Scotland with independence. It's clearer than ever that these issues now go hand in hand. Only independence gives us the power to drive forward the investment Scotland needs to meet its full potential. That article was by James Walker. This is from The National on Monday 19th February 2024. From the News section. University students to be offered option of year-long financial support by Ross Hunter. University students will be able to spread their financial support over a 12-month period to help with costs over the summer months. Typical, students were only able to access loans and bursaries over a nine-month period, with support unavailable during the months before the new academic year. However, the Scottish Government has confirmed eligible undergraduate students will now be able to spread the payments over a year. Students can select the 9 or 12 month options when applying through Student Awards Agency Scotland or SAS for the 2024 to 25 academic year. The annual payment will not change with those opting for the 12-month plan receiving lower monthly payments to spread it across the year. Higher Education Minister Graham Day said the summer months can be a difficult period for learners when their payments stop. These changes will ensure that learners can access the vital funds they need through the whole year round. This is another example of the actions being taken by the Scottish Government to support students through the cost of living crisis. Scotland already has the lowest student debt levels in the UK, which is thanks to our commitment to free tuition and our enhanced student support offering. We are already seeing a record number of students from Scotland's most deprived areas applying to study at university. The changes made to the student support package will help to further break down barriers and ensure that access to our world-class institutions is not denied to anyone, whatever their background. The change follows a successful two-year programme where care-experienced students were given the option of 12-month packages. care ex- Experienced students will continue to receive additional support for their living costs under the Summer Accommodation Grant from 2024. Those eligible will be entitled to a payment of up to £1,330 to ensure they do not fall into arrears over the summer. These changes will coincide with the £2,400 increase to the annual support package which sees the main undergraduate funding package rise up to £11,400. Eligible students living with family members or friends will be entitled to a grant of £665. That article was by Ross Hunter. From the National, Monday the 19th of February, from the comment section... Keir Starmer's austerity light will not deliver economic growth by Stuart P.M. McIntosh 
All the indicators point to a very substantial victory for Keir Starmer's Labour Party in the UK general election whenever it takes place. Last week, Labour won by-elections in Wellingborough, Northamptonshire, overturning a Conservative majority of more than 18,000, and in Kingswood, South Gloucestershire, where the party flipped a seat with an 11,220 Conservative majority. In Wellingborough, the swing to Labour was the second biggest in any post-war election. With results like this, you would think that Labour strategists would be busy setting out a series of dramatic policy shifts to further encourage its supporters and energise them in advance of a general election, painting the picture of how Labour will begin to reconstruct and rejuvenate Britain and its threadbare institutions. But no. We see the reverse. Keir Starmer is running away from his own policy proposals. More strikingly, gone is a potentially transformative commitment to a £28 billion per year UK green industrialisation, considered too expensive, too radical by the shadow treasury theme. This is a major loss for the UK economy. Such misplaced political timidity fails to learn the lessons from President Joe Biden's success in the US. As a candidate in 2019, Biden made big promises on industrial policy, infrastructure and climate change, even in a tight election contest. Biden offered a strikingly different vision of the US from his opponent Donald Trump, who did nothing on infrastructure and denied climate change and its dangers. Once elected, Biden passed a $1.2 trillion infrastructure act to repair America's roads, schools, utilities and much else besides. Biden then passed a landmark inflation reduction act containing $370 billion in green policies, which have electrified EV production, driven battery investment, and jump-started a raft of other early-stage green industries. What this shows is the positive impact of ambition, ambition and vision. People want their leaders to, to a picture of the future that is better than the present, one that is positive and dynamic, hopeful. Candidate Biden offered us as he simultaneously reassured voters of a return to political normalcy post-Trump, Biden was radical and calming at the same time. He then delivered dramatically, despite pushback from his own party. In 2020-21, Larry Summers, a former chair of the National Economic Council under Barack Obama, excoriated Biden's spending plans and industrial policies, forecasting a long multi-year period of inflation with the need for higher unemployment and a recession. Most US businesses economists expected the US to be in a recession by 2023, but they were wrong. Crucially, the economic results have been positive. US inflation fell to 3.1%, as central bank rates rose to 5.5%, and pandemic supply chain issues moderated. Wages, especially for non-supervisory workers, grew faster than inflation. The construction and manufacturing sectors boomed as thousands of infrastructure projects got going. Unemployment fell to 3.7%, near a 50-year low, Productivity jumped, growing at 3.2% at the end of 2023. The result? In 2023, the American economy grew at 2.5%, faster than any other major economy. Lo and behold, it turns out that pursuing expansionary industrial and climate change policies drives growth, jobs and the economy. Meanwhile, the UK, Germany and Japan have slipped into recession and China's economy is stuttering slowing, deflating. It is disappointment that Starmer fails to look across the Atlantic and learn the right lessons, promise real change, sketch out a brighter, better future for all, signal you will take bold steps once in office, be clear and consistent, signal a political step change for the UK and Scotland. Instead, Starmer is wringing his hands in worry, scared of his own shadow, offering austerity light and too few innovative solutions for an economy and country, strained and stressed by years of neglect of public services and the social contract. The US example shows that economic growth of today and tomorrow requires investment in a green, more sustainable future. That investment is not only essential for the planet, but also will drive our economies for decades to come. Biden today faces a further frustrating challenge making more voters see and value the real economic changes he has wrought, having delivered more than most thought possible. Indeed, 
Candidate Biden may lose in November if voters fail to credit him with his real economic victories. The contrast, contrast in London is stark. Each day, as local electoral winds mount, Starmer offers less just the same policies. Perhaps a Labour government will be more ambitious in office, but I worry that a shrunken policy platform will make it unlikely meaningful economic changes will be planned or be possible. And that was a comment piece by Stuart P. M. McIntosh, who is Executive Director of the Group of 30, G30, an international body of financiers and academics based in Washington, D.C., which aims to deepen understanding of economic and financial issues and to examine consequences of decisions made in the public and private sectors. From the National, Tuesday the 20th of February, from the Politics section, Labour call for immediate ceasefire in Gaza and major climb-down. Report by Hamish Morrison. Labour have called for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza, walking back support for Israeli's bombardment of Palestine. In the face of mounting domestic and international criticism of Israel's response to Hamas's attacks on October the 7th, Labour have been forced to alter their position. It comes just a day before MPs were due to vote on an SNP motion calling for a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas, which many Labour MPs were expected to support. Labour, on Tuesday, tabled an amendment to the SNP motion, which calls for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire, but which also calls for Israel to have the right to assurance that the horror of the 7th of October cannot happen again. A Labour spokesperson said, Our amendment calls for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire, in line with our allies. We need the hostages released and returned. We need the fighting to stop now. We need a massive humanitarian aid programme for Gaza. Any, and any military action on Rafa cannot go ahead. There needs to be an end to violence on all sides. Israelis have the right to secure that, that the horror of October the 7th cannot happen again. We want the fighting to stop now. We also have to be clear on how we prevent the violence starting up again. There will be no lasting peace without a diplomatic process that delivers a two-state solution with a safe and secure Israel alongside a viable Palestinian state. The SNP's motion goes further in its criticism of Israel than Labour's amendment, accusing the country of carrying out the, the collective punishment of Palestinians. Labour, meanwhile, stressed that a ceasefire could not be expected if Hamas continues with violence, but also called on Israel to comply with the International Court of Justice's provisional measures, which included the court ordering the country to take steps to prevent genocide in Gaza. It comes amid mounting criticism of Israel's bombardment of Gaza, which has so far seen 28,000 Palestinians killed and the creation of a major refugee crisis in the territory. It is estimated around half of Gaza's population, some 1.5 million people, are crammed into the border city of Rafa, which Israel has threatened with a major ground offensive in the coming weeks. While Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has told Palestinians in Rafa to flee the town, Observers have said there is nowhere for them to go, given that much of the Gaza Strip is now un uninhabitable. America has stepped up its criticism of Israel in light of the expected invasion, with the US proposing a United Nations Security Council resolution calling for a temporary ceasefire and opposing the Rafa offensive. Foreign Secretary David Cameron has also this week called for an, for an immediate pause in the fighting. Keir Starmer's party is extremely vulnerable to the domestic tensions created by Israel's assault on Gaza and has changed its position on the issue since fighting broke out in October. The SNP exposed cracks in Labour by forcing a vote in November calling for a ceasefire, while Starmer was arguing for humanitarian pauses to allow aid into Gaza. SNP Westminster leader Stephen Flynn said he had written to every member of Parliament urging them to support his party's ceasefire motion. In his letter, Flynn said, By failing to join the UN, world leaders and humanitarian organisations in calling for an immediate ceasefire, the UK has made one less likely. It's time for Westminster to end its silence and say enough is enough. No one is pretending this is a simple situation or that one vote will magically result in a ceasefire overnight, but a ceasefire is more than likely to happen if the UK Parliament and Government join international pressure than if they fail. 
The SNP bid has the support of Amnesty International Scotland director Neil Cowan, who said, The motion for an immediate ceasefire should be unreservedly supported by all parties and all MPs, not with ifs, buts or other qualifications. And that report was by political reporter Hamish Morrison. From the National, Tuesday the 20th of February, from the news section, Man charred as Scottish police seize £1.3 million worth of cocaine from car. Article by Ross Hunter. A 23-year-old man has been arrested after Class A drugs with a street value of more than £1 million were discovered by police. Officers found the £1.3 million worth of cocaine after stopping a black Volkswagen Golf on the Kingsway in Dundee on Monday. A man was arrested and charged in connection with the incident and is expected to appear at Dundee Sheriff Court in due, court in due course. Detective Inspector Julia Ogilvie said, This is a significant recovery and has removed harmful drugs from our communities. We take a proactive approach to target anyone involved in the supply of drugs and this demonstrates our commitment to dealing with this issue. If anyone has any information or concerns surrounding drugs in their local community, please contact us. Information can be given to police on 101. Alternatively, Crime Stoppers can be contacted anonymously on 0800 555 111. And that report was by Ross Hunter. From the National, Tuesday the 20th of February, from the news section, Ryanair, passengers panicked after an emergency at Scottish Airport. Report by Adam Robertson. Passengers waiting to take off from a Scottish airport were left panicked as emergency crews came on board minutes before it was due to take off. The flight was set to head to Tenerife from Edinburgh Airport before its departure was halted as the plane was surrounded by fire crews on Saturday afternoon. Three fire engines raced to the aircraft as it sat in the tarmac and pointed water cannons at the plane, one traveller told the Daily Record. The passenger told how she was left scared as everyone was told to disembark due to a technical issue. It was later discovered the issue was a fuel leak and the plane was unable to take off during its 1.10pm slot on Saturday afternoon. Passengers were taken to another flight which departed at around 3pm. Lisa Conway, 32, was going on holiday with her partner David Smith when the incident occurred. She said, People on the plane were panicking in case the plane went on fire with water cannons pointed at it. We were then packed onto buses and we couldn't get off as they had to move crew and ground staff and secure the fuel leak. First time I've experienced anything like that. It was scary. Ryanair also confirmed to the Daily Record that staff carried out standard procedures and fire crews were called as a precaution. A spokesperson said, This flight from Edinburgh to Tenerife, February 17, was delayed ahead of a takeoff due to a minor take issue with the aircraft. The aircraft remained on stand. Passengers were disembarked and the aircraft was taken back for inspection by engineers who cleared the aircraft to return to service later that night. To minimise disruption to passengers, a replacement aircraft was quickly arranged and to operate this flight, departing Edinburgh approximately 1 hour and 40 minutes later. We sincerely apologise for this delay. And that report was by Adam Robertson. From the National, Tuesday the 20th of February, from the news section, explained what the new UK visa rules for overseas care workers mean for you. Report by Abby Garton Crosby. The Tories in Westminster have pushed forward with plans to make it impossible for care workers to bring their families to the UK. Home Secretary James Cleverly laid an order in the House of Commons on Monday, which will see the changes take effect on March the 11th. But what is the ban and how will it impact on the care sector? What will this mean for care workers hoping to move to the UK from overseas? Any care worker who takes up employment in the UK will no longer be able to bring loved ones, such as spouses, partners and children, with them under the visa rules set to go live in March. Children and dependents were previously allowed entry into the UK under the Health and Care Worker Visa. Elsewhere, outside of the care sector in NHS, 
Any spouse or partner of a UK citizen wishing to move to the UK will not be granted a visa unless until they earn a salary of £29,000 from April the 4th. This will be gradually scaled up to £38,700 by early 2025. The UK government could be facing legal action over the salary threshold plans. Why are the Tories making these visa changes? It's part of their bid to tackle legal migration and reduce the number of people coming from overseas to live in the UK. The UK government has said that approximately 12,000 dependents accompanied 100,000 care workers and senior care workers in the year ending September 2023. Announcing that he was pressing forward with the plans, cleverly claimed it was one part of our plan to deliver the biggest ever cut in migration. What does it mean for the care sector? The move may cut m- migration numbers, but it is also likely to have a detrimental impact on filling the thousands of care worker vacancies across Scotland and the UK. The vacancy rate in social care is currently at around 9.9%. This is the equivalent of around 152,000 empty positions on any given day, with care providers stating explicitly that overseas workers are crucial to staffing. Cash-strapped local authorities have also reported issues putting care packages in place due to a lack of available workers. After the impact of Brexit on the industry, Cleverly's decision is likely to compound the issue even further. What was the reaction? Scottish politicians north of the border were furious at the decision, with SNP Westminster Group leader Stephen Flynn decrying the policy as a populist idiocy. Scottish Minister for Social Care, Marie Todd, said the Scottish Government was in clear opposition to the plans and called for a fairer migration system. She said, The care sector is one of the most badly impacted by Brexit, with many valued staff choosing to leave Scotland as a result, and the UK government's attempt to ban overseas workers from bringing family members with them will damage our care sector further by deterring workers from coming here. Donald McCaskill, CEO of Scottish Care, also hit out on the move in social media, adding, This is shameful and damaging. Scotland's social care sector needs an immigration policy fit for our needs. Treating international colleagues in this manner is contemptible, saying, come and work for us, but don't make this your home. And that report was by Abby Garton Crosby. The National, recorded on Tuesday 20th of February 2024. The Culture Section. Ancient Highland Games Silverware Trophy Returns to Scotland. By James Walker, Multimedia Journalist. A piece of ancient Highland Games silverware has made its long-awaited return to Scotland. The last silver rose bowl was traditionally awarded to the best performing athlete at the Cabrach Picnic and Games in Moray. Once a staple of the Highland Games calendar, which ran annually from 1877 to 1935. But the bowl then went missing. It was only when the Cabrach Trust, who in 2022 reintroduced the event after an 87-year hiatus, restarted the hunt for the trophy, that it was found and returned to its rightful home. A public plea for information in June 2023 by the Trust was seen by Adrian Taylor, the grandson of the last winner of the Rose Bowl, who decided it was time to return the silverware to home soil. The 73-year-old from Axminster in Devon said, I was having a clear out of my house and came across the Rose Bowl, then googled it to find out more, whereupon I found the news that the Cabrach Trust was seeking its safe return. My grandfather Charles Taylor was the last winner of the Rose Bowl. He was a brilliant athlete as well as a fine musician, being particularly talented in the bagpipes. And though it's been nice to have the silverware in the family for the past few decades, it is fitting that, with the return of the Cabrach Picnic and Games two years ago, it returns home. Jonathan Christie, CEO of the Cabrach Trust, said, I could not believe it when I unsuspectingly answered the phone and found myself speaking with Adrian Taylor. We are beyond delighted to welcome the Rose Bowl back to its rightful home and are indebted to Adrian for recognising its significance to the Cabrach's rich culture and history. Having committed to reintroducing the Cabrach picnic and games for people near and far to enjoy, we are so happy to have the Rose Bowl, traditionally the top prize in the 1920s, available as a grand prize for the best performing competitor at the event. 
Charlie Murray, chair of the Royal Scottish Highland Games Association, said The Cabrach Rose Bowl represents a key component of the history of Scottish Highland Games. Silverware like this is steeped in the heritage of traditional Highland sport and it's culturally very significant that such prizes remain as the reward for the finest athletes that grace our games. By James Walker, The National, recorded on Tuesday 20th of February 2024. The Culture Section Exclusive Fears UK Government Will Block Funding For Pro-Independence Artists By Xander Eliards, Content Editor There are concerns that musicians and artists who support Scottish independence could be blocked from UK Government-backed grants amid a culture compared to McCarthyism 2.0. Artists have raised the alarm after the Tory government moved to overrule an independent panel and prevent the Belfast-based band Kneecap from receiving funding due to their anti-unionist views. Justifying the decision, a spokesperson for Business Secretary Kemi Badenoch claimed to fully support freedom of speech but added, It is hardly surprising that we don't want to hand out UK taxpayers' money to people that oppose the United Kingdom itself. NECAP has threatened the UK government with legal action over the move, and now concerns have been raised that the Tories' statement might have far-reaching consequences. Iona Fife, an award-winning Scots folk singer, said, For me, the scary consequence is that only bands and artists who are supportive of the Union and the UK government will reap the benefits of grants such as MEGS, the Music Export Growth Scheme. The whole thing is giving McCarthyism 2.0. If the UK government firmly believes in rewarding bands and artists that are sympathetic to the Union and to the government of the day, then it risks going down a dark authoritarian path, seeking to silence and punish any critics. MEGS aims to gain a return on investment for the UK by handing money to musicians. A UK government press release from earlier in the month states MEGS has invested more than £6 million in British music, leading to an estimated £55.5 million financial return to the UK economy. SNP MP Pete Wishart, who was in the Scottish band Runrig before joining Parliament in 2001, said MEGS was designed to support artists to grow international markets following the disaster of Brexit on touring acts in the EU. He went on, Only the Tories would be so politically obsessed to award funding according to a band's views in the Constitution. If this was to be applied across the board, very few artists in Scotland would qualify for any support as Scotland's musical community, almost to a man and woman, is committed to seeing Scotland emerge as an independent nation. You can only imagine the application forms with bands interrogated about their levels of support for the UK and asked if they've ever supported an independent Scotland. This nonsense only compounds the needless bureaucracy on artists and introduces a sinister political test. He added, David Powell, a painter and sculptor from Wales who now works in the Netherlands, suggests that the Meg's move was part of a wider pattern, pointing online to a scandal which engulfed Arts Council England after it warned artists that political statements could break funding agreements. Powell said the UK government was systematically and pathologically attacking the arts to remake it in its own grotesque image. He went on, The Tories don't like to be reminded of their criminally abject failures. They certainly cannot abide artists telling them uncomfortable truths about the crushing impacts of their austerity policies and engineered insolvency of councils and public services. Woe betides a group like Kneecap who can rip the piss out of imperialist demagogues with songs like Get Your Brits Out. That is clearly going too far. The snowflake Tories are delicate flowers. You might hurt their feelings. Both Powell and Fife argued that art has a history of holding power to account and that by withholding funding for groups critical of their politics, the UK government was in dangerous territory. Fife said, Through song, poetry, art and literature, Artists shine a light on injustices of the state and give a voice to those persecuted by governments and politicians of all different stripes. The business secretary has revealed herself to be a soft-touch sham of a politician, on the one hand preaching free speech whilst on the other silencing those who disagree with her. This is a dangerous precedent the UK government has set, but there should be no doubt it's one that artists throughout the world will challenge without fear or favour. The UK government said it would respond to the Sunday Nationals' request for comment, but did not. By Xander Eliards. The National News on Wednesday the 21st of February. BBC Scotland axes the Nine as part of a major shake-up. An article written by Adam Robertson. BBC Scotland has announced yesterday that it's scrapping its flagship news programme The Nine amid a series of changes to its news and current affairs services. 
The broadcaster said the show will be replaced by a new 30-minute news programme at 7pm on the channel, subject to approval from Ofcom. According to figures from January, The Nine only reached 8,200 viewers on its most successful day that month. The BBC also confirmed it would be regularly extending Reporting Scotland on BBC One for a number of hour-long special editions. It added that the new programme will follow Reporting Scotland at 6.30pm on BBC One Scotland and will have coverage from across Scotland, the UK and the world, subject to Ofcom approval. The plans also involve bringing The Edit, an entertainment news programme, and Seven Days, a weekly news review programme on the BBC Scotland channel, to a close. Debate Night will have a longer series run this year, increasing from 24 episodes to 30 episodes. A new topical current affairs series will be published as a podcast on BBC Sounds and also be available to audiences on BBC iPlayer, the BBC Scotland Channel and BBC One Scotland, and the plan is for it to run four times a week in this election year. Both will launch later this year. BBC Scotland said the moves are designed to grow the impact of broadcast news services in Scotland while offering audiences more ways to watch and listen to news and current affairs output across all its services. It said there will be no staff job losses associated with the plans. BBC Scotland Head of News and Current Affairs Gary Smith said It's going to be a busy year for news with a UK election and American election and Scotland's trip to Germany for the Euros. We need to make sure we keep changing our output as audience habits change so that we provide the best possible service for our audiences in the formats and on the platforms they want. I'm very proud that The Nine has produced such great journalism and developed such great talent over the past five years and I'm confident that our new offer to audiences will continue to meet those high standards. Last month, BBC Scotland director Steve Carson was questioned by MSPs on really low television audiences for The Nine after it emerged one episode had just 1,700 people watching. He told Holyrood's Culture Committee it was important not to take things in isolation and that the average viewing figures were higher. The Nine, which launched in 2019, broadcasts from Monday to Thursday, while news programme The Seven is broadcast at 7pm from Friday to Saturday. The new 7pm programme, following Reporting Scotland at 6.30pm on BBC One Scotland, will have coverage from across Scotland, the UK and the world. There will be an increase in the frequency of live online reporting and explanatory articles on the news website and the app. Mr Carson said, these changes play to our strengths as an innovative broadcaster that delivers high-quality journalism across all our platforms. The BBC said its operating licence currently requires the BBC Scotland channel to show 250 hours per year of news. The new news programme will require an amendment to the operating licence and therefore will be subject to consultation with and the approval of Ofcom. An article written by Adam Robertson The National On Wednesday the 21st of February Opinion How close is Australia to becoming a republic? A column written by Steph Braun Since the death of Queen Elizabeth and King Charles's ascent to the throne, attitudes towards the British royal family have dramatically changed right across the world. At the turn of the year, polling in the UK showed for the first time that support for the monarchy had dipped below 50%. In the past few years, we've also seen Barbados become a republic, while several other Caribbean nations have said they intend to hold referendums on ditching the monarchy in the near future. Queen Elizabeth was someone many Australians held dear, with even Republicans describing her as a respected public figure. But former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull once said Australians are Elizabethans, not monarchists. As King Charles prepares to make his first trip down under as monarch later this year, the National asked Isaac Jeffrey, National Director of the Australian Republic Movement, where the nation is now on the royals and how close he thinks a referendum is on becoming a republic. Last time Australia held a vote on becoming a republic in 1999, it failed with 54% voting against the idea. 
but last year the country's High Commissioner, Stephen Smith, said it was inevitable it would now happen. Recent polling by Australian papers, The Daily Telegraph and The Mercury, put support for a republic at 52% and 60% respectively, but internal polling by the Australian Republic movement suggests as few as 8% of Australians now back the royal family staying in place. Mr Jeffrey told The National, people are telling us they want a say in who leads and represents them. They also want accountability and transparency from office holders. Queen Elizabeth was a respected public figure and the only head of state a lot of Aussies had for their whole lives. Following her passing, Australia has started the conversation about the role of head of state. It's no reflection on the royal family or the British people. We'll always be friends and allies. It's about having a democratically elected and accountable Aussie. We're proud of representing us on the world stage and working full-time and fully committed solely to Australia. When asked how Australians feel about King Charles, Mr Jeffrey said it was difficult to see how he could ever resonate with people and most don't care about him or his heirs at all, despite the press continuing to cover regular updates on their movements. He detailed how, just like in the UK, people are increasingly struggling to relate to the monarchy amid widespread financial difficulties. He said, we're in the midst of a cost-of-living crisis. People are struggling to pay their bills and meet their mortgage payments. And I'm not sure the vast majority of Australians could imagine being born into outrageous wealth, power and privilege. A multi-billion dollar property portfolio and 500 personal staff are so far removed from the Aussie notion of having a go and working hard to get ahead, so it's hard to see how that life experience can truly resonate. I think some Aussies enjoy the show, much like they enjoy Neighbours, but the majority just don't care what they're doing. They are irrelevant, rich celebrities on the other side of the world, and that's why we're so open to becoming a republic. Public opinion certainly seems to suggest that Australia is only heading in one direction, but how soon a referendum will happen is complicated to predict. In October, a referendum was held to amend the constitution to recognise Indigenous Australians and create a body for them to advise government, but the idea was overwhelmingly rejected. The referendum, dubbed The Voice, was Australia's first in almost a quarter of a century. With the majority of ballots counted, the no vote led the yes vote 60% to 40%. Mr Jeffrey said that referendum had been very divisive and believes the country may now be going through referendum fatigue. That said, he said he could still see a vote on a republic happening in the next few years. He said there is significant support for a republic. We've just had a very divisive referendum last year, so there is some referendum fatigue, but I think it's possible we could see a vote within the next term of Parliament, possibly around 2027. The important thing is that we have the conversation with the Australian people and get their active involvement in shaping our next chapter. So we'll take the time to get it right. Mr Jeffrey said removing the King as Head of State would have practical and symbolic importance in Australia, but would not represent a wholesale overhaul of government. After the Australia Act of 1986, the country severed almost all ties to the UK system apart from the monarch as Head of State, but while there is a clear desire to remove that final link, Mr Jeffrey claimed Australians are not seeking a US-style executive president. Mr Jeffrey said they'd prefer a style similar to the Irish system. The head of state would be largely ceremonial, with some limited powers to ensure the smooth operation of parliament and government. We'll still have the Westminster system and a prime minister as head of government, who handles the day-to-day -day administration and lawmaking, but we'd also have an Aussie acting in our best interests and representing us as an equal on the world stage. A column written by... Steph Braun. The National News on Wednesday, the 21st of February. Police officers to get body cams by the late summer. An article written by Laura Pollock. Body worn cameras will be rolled out to frontline police Scotland officers in the late summer, the force's chief has said. 
Chief Constable Joe Farrell said in a report said to go before the Scottish Police Authority board meeting tomorrow that since taking on the role in October last year, one of her top priorities has been to equip more officers with the cameras generally worn on the officer's chest. Ms Farrell said assaults on police officers and staff have fallen, but any assault is one too many. She said body cams and tasers both could impact positively on behaviour. She said, One of my first commitments to my fellow officers and staff when I joined Police Scotland was that we had to push on with the rollout of body-worn video. We are moving at pace and I expect rollout to frontline officers and staff to begin in the late summer. An article written by Laura Pollock. The National Politics on Wednesday the 21st of February. SNP headquarters staff said to be re-interviewed by police in party finance probe. An article written by Judith Duffy. Staff at SNP headquarters are said to be re-interviewed by police investigating the finances of the party. It has been reported. Workers have been sent letters which ask them to speak to officers, with the move being directed by the Crown Office, according to the Times. It includes staff who were not in place when the inquiry began. Operation Branch Form, the probe into the SNP finances, has now run for more than two and a half years. It has seen the high-profile arrests of former First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, her husband Peter Murrell, former SNP Chief Executive, and Colin Beattie, the party's former Treasurer. All were released without charge, pending further investigation. Sources told the Times that Mr Murrell has been keeping an extremely low profile. One senior figure said, Nobody talks about him, nobody has seen him, nobody knows where he is. Operation Branch Form is looking into what happened to around £600,000 raised by the party for independence campaigning. Last July, then Chief Constable of Police Scotland, Ian Livingstone, suggested that the investigation had moved beyond the initial complaint and said that the time taken over it was absolutely necessary. At the end of last year, it was reported the probe had so far cost more than £1 million and two former sheriffs called for clarity on its progress. In January, First Minister Hamza Youssef addressed the issue of the police investigation into SNP finances, saying it clearly affected the public perception of the party. He said that the inquiry has been one of the most difficult times for the SNP and that he must work hard to rebuild that trust. A spokesman for the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service said senior professional prosecutors from the Fiscal Service and an advocate deputy are working with police on this ongoing investigation. It's standard practice that any case regarding politicians is dealt with by prosecutors without the involvement of the law officers. All Scotland's prosecutors act independently of political interference. As is routine to protect the integrity of ongoing investigations, we do not comment in detail on their conduct. An SNP spokesman said, As we've said previously, the SNP has been cooperating with the inquiry and will continue to do so. However, it's not appropriate to comment further on a live investigation. An article written by Judith Duffy. From the National, Thursday the 22nd of February, from the news section, kayaker rescued after spending two hours in water near Scottish Island. Report by Lucinda Cameron. A teenage kayaker has been rescued after his kayak capsized and he spent two hours climbing to the upturned hull. The 17-year-old kayaker raised the alarm by using his mobile phone to contact a family member when he capsized, but they were unable to get back in touch with him. Kyle Arenali lifeboat went to the scene in Broadford Bay, off the Isle of Skye, arriving at 5.40pm on Wednesday, and Portree lifeboat arrived about 40 minutes later. They searched the area, with help from local fishing vessels, and at 6.40pm, a Coast Guard helicopter arrived at the scene. The helicopter located the teenager still, climbing to, still clinging to his upturned kayak, and Kyle left lifeboat retrieved him from the water. Norman Finlayson, helm for Kyle's INLI lifeboat, said the casualty was an experienced kayaker who was well equipped to be out in the water. Conditions were good when he went out. However, unfortunately, they began to deteriorate quite quickly. 
he did exactly the correct thing in taking and using his mobile phone to raise the alarm and then staying with his kayak until he was located. He was wearing all the correct clothing to be out on the water, which made all the difference when spending that amount of time in the water. After assessing the teenager, the lifeboat crew began warming him up as he had been in the water for more than two hours. They took him to the pier in Broadford, where they handed him over to the care of the Scottish Ambulance Service. And that report was by Lucinda Cameron. From the National, Thursday the 22nd of February, in the politics section, Lindsay Hoyle fighting for job after plunging Westminster into chaos, an article first published on the 21st of February and written by content editor Xander Eliards. The Speaker of the House of Commons is fighting for his job after he plunged Westminster into chaos on Wednesday. Multiple SNP MPs have called for Lindsay Hoyle to resign his position and he is facing a no-confidence motion tabled by a Tory MP. It comes after Hoyle took the decision to break with long-established convention, a key pillar of the UK's uncodified constitution, and allow a debate on a Labour amendment to an SNP opposition day motion calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. Hoyle's decision came despite his chief advisor on parliamentary procedure, Clerk of the House Tom Goldsmith, warning that to do so would be a departure from the norm and risk a situation where the SNP motion was not even voted on. Amid the fury at Hoyle's decision, Tory Prime Minister Penny Morton gave a special statement where she claimed that he had undermined the House of Commons and said the government would be boycotting the vote on Gaza ceasefire as a result. Labour's amendment then passed without opposition because Deputy Speaker Rosie Winterton declared that the eyes have it without going to a vote. Winterton's move was criticised by both SNP and Tory MPs. She then insisted, the fact is I put the question, nobody called against it. But SNP Chris Laws could be seen shouting, this is a farce, while Tory party chairman Richard Holden appears to call out, call out yes they did. Jacob B. Smog told MPs, it is absolutely extraordinary that that noise level was deemed to be I. It is inconceivable that anybody hearing it would have thought it was I. Labour MPs, including Shadow Scottish Secretary Ian Murray, nevertheless celebrated the party's motion being passed unopposed. SNP group leader Stephen Flynn demanded three times in the Commons for Hoyle to come and face MPs and explain his reasoning for the decision, which had plunged Westminster into chaos. The Aberdeen South MP was eventually told that Hoyle would not return until Thursday, after which the SNP and many other Tory MPs dramatically walked out of the chamber. Hussam Zomlot, the Palestinian ambassador to the UK, said that the scenes in the Commons were British politics at its lowest. This is disgraceful and shameful. After 100,000 Palestinians killed, maimed and injured, he added. As the chaos continued, Hoyle did finally return to give a statement. Responding to Morton's criticism, the Speaker said he had made the decision with the right intentions and without political motivation, despite reports he had met Labour leader Keir Starmer, Starmer earlier in the day. I've got to say I regret how it's ended up, Hoyle told MPs. It was not my intention. I wanted all to ensure they could express their views and all sides of the House could vote. As it was, in particular the SNP were ultimately unable to vote on their pro- proposition. Responding after the debate concluded, Flynn said that Hoyle had turned Westminster into a circus, called for an investigation and raised concerns that had been warned of, of officials exactly what could happen. He told Sky News, Thanks to the actions of the Speaker of the House of Commons, the SNP has been stitched up to the point that the Labour Party was the only game in town today. Flynn stopped short of calling for Hoyle to lose his job, saying, I'm going to allow him the opportunity to explain to me why he decided to put the Labour Party before the Scottish National Party's interest. He is supposed to be impartial. That has not happened. He went on, Everyone knows that Keir Starmer was in to speak with the Speaker before his decision today. I think Keir Starmer should be standing here right now and explaining himself why he believed that he couldn't back an SNP motion calling for an immediate ceasefire which condemned Israel for its collective punishment of the Palestinian people. And, 
As a result, the Speaker himself has found himself in an intolerable position where MPs, quite frankly, were a complete loss. Labour and Deputy Speaker Windington both strongly refuted reports that the party had pressured Hoyle to allow their amendment to be debated, threatening to remove him from the Speaker's chair after a general election if he did not. Other SNP MPs have not stopped short of calling for Hoyle to go. Joanna Cherry said she has signed an early day motion tabled by Tory MP William Bragg, the respected chair of the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee, which calls in the House to say that there is no confidence in Hoyle. Pete Wishart, the SNP's longest serving MP, wrote, What an absolute circus and this is all in the Speaker. Lindsay Hoyle remaining in place is now intolerable. Asked if he had seen anything like it in his 23 years as an MP, Wishart told PA, Absolutely nothing like this. I've been through Iraq, through the whole dramas when it came to an independence and referendum, through Brexit. There has never been a day quite like this. His SNP colleague, MP Stuart MacDonald, wrote, The Speaker is the author of this farce. He was well regarded personally by many, but he has driven a coach and horses through any confidence we can have in him remaining in post. Worse, he cowardly left it to his deputies to try to mop up the mess. He should resign. Hoyle said he had taken the decision to allow Labour's amendment to be debated because he wanted to allow the maximum range of views to be discussed and due concerns about MP security. He told the Chamber, The danger is, that's why I wanted everybody to express, because I am very, very concerned about the, sec- the security of all members. I was very concerned, I am still concerned, and that's why the meetings I have had today is about the security of members their families and the people that are involved. Hoyle added, I am, and I regret, with my sadness that it's ended up in this position. It was never my intention for it to end like this. I was absolutely convinced that the decision was done with the right intentions. I recognise the strength of feeling of members on this issue. And that report is by Xander Eliance. From the National... Thursday the 22nd of February, in the politics section. Palestine Ambassador gives damning take on Westminster Gaza vote chaos. Article by James Walker. The Palestinian Ambassador to the UK has said that the chaos in the House of Commons over the Gaza ceasefire votes is British politics at its lowest. Hussam Zonlot told Channel 4 that it was disgraceful and shameful. It comes after Speaker Lindsay Hoyle took the decision to break with the long-established convention and allow a debate on a Labour amendment to an SNP Opposition Day motion calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. This led to chaos in the House of Commons, with the SNP effectively unable to vote on their own motion and walking out alongside Tory MPs in protest. Labour's amendment calling for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza was ultimately approved because Deputy Speaker Rosie Winterton declared that the eyes have it without going to a vote. So much said it wasn't only not a good day for the House of Commons, it's not a good day for the UK, it's not a good day for humanity. To see the scenes in the House of Commons is really British politics at its lowest, he added. It's disgraceful and shameful that MPs are debating on whether or not they should call for an immediate ceasefire after 100,000 Palestinians are killed maimed, injured, after 70% of their houses are gone, after all of the health sector is bombarded, all the education sector annihilated, and then the ICJ comes and says that Israel is now officially on trial for genocide. He said that the fact that MPs are still debating and politicking has shown everybody they are defending and protecting their careers as opposed to defending and protecting children. The weakening of the aid operation in Gaza threatens to deepen misery across the territory where Israel airing ground offensive, launched in response to Hamas's October 7th attack, has killed more than 29,000 Palestinians, obliterated entire neighbourhoods and dispatched more than 80% of the population of 2.3 million. And that report is by James Walker. That concludes this week's edition of the National Podcast. Please remember to subscribe to our channels at Tune Review and tell your friends about our service.